invite you to pray with me. Creator of the moon and the stars, there is indeed none like you. And it is our great pleasure to gather in your presence today, to gather around your word given to us in scripture and in song. And as we do, I pray that the words of my mouth and the thoughts and prayers and songs of all of our hearts are pleasing to you, our rock and our redeemer. Amen. I would like to begin today by inviting you to imagine for a moment. Imagine that you are sitting on a hill. And below you, at the bottom of the hill, moving horizontally across your view, is a single pair of train tracks. And from your right, moving across your left, a locomotive comes, pulling an endless string of boxcars. The lid, or the top, to each boxcar is open, so from your perch looking down, you can see inside. And you notice that in every boxcar, is an equally large, rounded pile of sand, tiny, tiny grains of sand in each successive car. And furthermore, imagine that you almost have blinders on. You're not looking to the right or to the left, just straight ahead, and that every second another boxcar comes into your view, 1,001, 1,002, boxcar after boxcar after boxcar full of sand. And imagine now, finally, that every grain of sand in every boxcar that's moving every second past your view represents one star in the heavens. And now, the question, how long would you have to sit on that hill watching boxcars full of sand pass by your view to account for every star in the heavens? An hour? A day? A week? Would you believe the answer is nine years? Nine years. So abundant are the stars in the heavens. Oh Lord, my God, when I in awesome wonder consider all the worlds thy hands have made. Today, we begin a new sermon series. It's called Plain Favorites, Hymns and Songs. Every week in the month of July, we are going to preach on one of your favorite hymns or songs. We asked you about a month or so ago to share with us your favorite Christian hymns. We compiled them all and made a top five list. Actually, you're in luck. This is a baker's half dozen for this sermon series. Don is going to preach on August 5th on his favorite hymn. That's a bonus. Six for the price of five. But today we begin that sermon series with How Great Thou Art. It's a good choice of yours. I'm glad it's in your top five favorites. In 2001, in the popular magazine Christianity Today, in a survey they conducted, it was ranked as the number two favorite American hymn of all time, behind only, not surprisingly, Amazing Grace. But if you're number two to Amazing Grace, that's not a bad place to be. But did you know, did you know that How Great Thou Art wasn't always so popular? That it wasn't even sung 
in American churches and worship until the 1950s, that it didn't even appear in hymn books until the late 1950s and early 1960s. And at the, in Central Christian Church, we use the blue chalice hymnal. It's right in the pew pocket in front of you. That hymnal was printed in 1995. Don came in 1998. Sometime between 1995 and 1998, we made a choice to purchase that hymnal. That replaced the red hymnal, published in 1970. You might remember that. How Great Thou Art is in our new hymnal, 1995, but it wasn't even in the 1970 version. Not until Charles Watkins was here were you singing that song on a regular basis. That means that How Great Thou Art is a contemporary song. <laughs> joyful, joyful, we adore thee, right? Did everybody know that one? That's Beethoven, that's ancient. <laughs> How Great Thou Art is cutting edge, new. It actually has a beautiful history. It, it first appeared as a poem written in, in 1885 by a man named Carl Boberg in Sweden. Carl Boberg was the son of a carpenter. We've heard that before. Went on to work as a sailor and then became a lay minister in the Missional Covenant Church of Sweden. He lived in southeastern Sweden on the coast on a bay, small town, my Swedish pronunciation is nothing to write home about, but it's something like Münsedes. And according to Karl Boberg, in 1885, he was walking home from an afternoon worship service on a Sunday from a neighboring, in a neighboring town. And as he was walking home, the hour was approaching the late afternoon, early evening, and he was entering his town, walking along the bay on this country road, when all of a sudden, an enormous storm blew up, completely unexpectedly. The sky grew black, and thunder roared, and lightning flashed across the sky, and rains hammered down from above, and Mighty winds ripped across the countryside, billowing the grains of wheat and rolling the waters on the bay into raging waves. It slammed violently against the rocks. And then, as suddenly as the storm blew up, it stopped. And everything was still again. And from across the marsh, a single bird began to sing and a rainbow hovered over the bay, which now shone smooth like a mirror reflecting up against the clearing sky. And far off in the distance, the vespers' evening worship bells were beginning to chime. And Carl Boberg made it to his home, sat down, and that evening wrote nine verses to a poem that he called Our Great God. Shortly thereafter, he set it to the tune of a simple Swedish folk song that began, dun, 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 dun. And that became How Great Thou Art. In our hymnal, there are four verses today that we sing routinely. And the first two verses are meant to depict and illustrate what Boberg, Boberg experienced on that Sunday afternoon walking to his home along the bay. The power and the majesty and, and the awesomeness and the immensity and the vastness and the tranquility and the peace of God's creation on full display in one afternoon. O oh Lord, my God, when I, in awesome wonder, consider all the worlds thy hands have made, I see the stars, I hear the rolling thunder, 
thy power throughout the universe displayed. And when through the woods and forest glades I wander and hear the birds sing sweetly in the trees, <laughs> then sings my soul, my Savior, God, to thee, how great thou art. It's meant to generate humility in us, as Tina said with the children. I mean, when we think that, 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 that our God is, is so great that there's nine years worth of boxcars full of stars in the heavens, how could we not feel small and insignificant in the face of that, that glory and grandeur? And those first two verses of How Great Thou Art are, are meant to, to embody the humility and the spirit of, of humility of Psalm 8. Psalm 8. And, and in fact, Carl Boberg based that poem, Our Great God, on the, the tone and tenor of Psalm 8. Listen to these few words from Psalm 8 and see how similarly they sound to those words, those lyrics of how great thou art. O Lord, our Lord, how majestic is your name in all the earth. When I look at your heavens, the work of your fingers, the moon and the stars which you have established, what are human beings that you are mindful of them? What are mortals that you would care for them? In other words, who am I? that you would, would do all of this and that I would be the recipient of its beauty. God is so great and we are so small and yet we are so very blessed that God would freely choose to share and unfold this creation with us. What do we say when we stand in the midst of that? <sighs> Nothing. We're speechless. Words fail. That's the spirit of how great thou art in Psalm 8. But that's only the first two verses. <laughs> verses 3 and 4 were written much later. In fact, by somebody else. The song, How Great Thou Art, first migrated over to Russia. Geographically, you know, up there way north by the North Pole, Sweden and, and, and Russia are, are pretty close. <laughs> and so the, the song matriculated its way into Russia where it was widely dispersed. And it was there in the early 1930s that an English missionary named Stuart Hine heard it. He loved it right away. He was an evangelist working in the Ukraine which geographically is in the western part of the former Soviet Union, eastern part of Eastern Europe, there between Europe and Russia. And he was working there for many years, fluent in Russian, working in the Ukraine. And he said that his, his style of evangelizing was to travel from village to village and determine if there were any Christians already there. And if there were, he would build, use them to build a Christian community in that area. And in one village, he said there were only two people, a husband and wife, a peasant couple that were Christian. His name was Dimitri. Her name was Ludmilla. Uneducated, except she could read. She learned how to read by reading the Bible, which she was able to do when a Russian soldier years earlier had left a Bible in the household when he was passing through. Stuart Hine had visited with Dimitri and Ludmilla, and the plan was that he was going to come to the house on an afternoon and they were going to invite some other villagers and, and together they would evangelize to these visitors. Well, Stuart Hine would later say that he was approaching the house that afternoon and as he did so, he heard some voices coming from within the house through the open window. And as he got closer, he could tell what was going on, what was being said. Ludmilla was reading for the visitors, the scripture from the Gospel of John where it speaks of the crucifixion of Jesus. And they were in the process of converting. In fact, they were in the act of repenting. 
repenting of their sinfulness. And, and Stuart Hines said that, that in the Ukraine, this was not a private affair. This was nothing to be ashamed about where you whisper your, your sins to yourself maybe in silence so nobody hears you for fear of embarrassment. No, this was a public affair and it was done out loud. And so we could hear these people confessing their brokenness and their sinfulness and at the same time praising God for the forgiving gift of life and love in Jesus Christ. And so as he got very close, he didn't want to disturb the moment. So he leaned up against the house next to the open window and slid down till he was sitting on the ground, pulled out his notebook, and as best he could, he said, wrote down word for word these words of confession and praise that were coming through the open window. And he took them home and worked them into verse 3. And when I think that God, his son, not sparing sent him to die, I, I scarce can take it in, that, that on the cross my burden, gladly bearing, he bled and died to take away my sin. When we sing that, verse 3, we are united, connected with those Ukrainian peasants who spoke those words of confession all those years ago. Well, about a year later, Stuart Hine had to leave the Ukraine Joseph Stalin, the Soviet dictator, was leading purges and persecutions into Ukraine at that time. And so he went over to Poland, and he stayed there for six years until Adolf Hitler in September of 39 invaded and World War II began. And so he migrated his way back to the United Kingdom. And for the next 10 years, he would work with Russian refugees. He loved the country. Loved the people, loved the language. And his life's mission then was to help people who had escaped the Soviet Union and had resettled in Great Britain. And in 1948, he met a man, a Russian refugee, who told him this story. He said, after the war, or as the, as the war was wrapping up, he and his wife wanted to escape Russia and move west. And so they were doing that. But in the process of doing that, they became separated and they'd never seen each other since. For three years, he was wondering where his wife was and if they'd be reunited. At the time of their separation, she was a Christian, but he was not, and that's something that he regretted. However, he had since converted. And so he was looking forward to connecting with his wife again and sharing this faith that she had always wanted him to have, but he had held at arm's length. He was afraid that they might not be able to see each other again. And he said that he could honestly accept that, though. Because of his new faith in Jesus Christ, he was already looking forward to the day when Christ would call him home and call her home. And if they couldn't be reunited on earth, then they might at one day be reunited for all eternity in the kingdom of heaven. And Stuart Hine was so impressed by that story that he paraphrased that into verse 4. When Christ shall come with shout of acclamation and take me home, what joy shall fill my heart. And I shall bow in humble adoration and there proclaim, my God, how great thou art. And so the song went on to become a, a wildly popular hymn in Christian Great Britain. But it didn't make it over to the United States for another 10 years. An American preacher in the early 1950s traveled to London, heard it, honestly didn't think too much of it at first. But in 1957, he had it played at a worship service he was leading in Madison Square Garden, in New York City. And from that point on, where the crowd loved it and asked for it to be played again and again and again, from that point on in 1957, which is why the hymn doesn't appear in our hymnals until the 1960s and beyond. From that point on in 1957, there wasn't another crusade that Billy Graham led for How Great Thou Art 
wasn't featured. Why do we sing? I know there are people here, maybe not up here, but there are people here who say, I can't sing. And you know what? Maybe it's true. <laughs> but why do we sing? Why do we invest in things like organs and organists? And why do we put all this emotional energy into changing the hymnal every few decades? Why do we have hymn books? And why do we sing on Sunday morning an opening hymn and a prayer hymn and a closing hymn? Why? Here's why. Because we sing what we cannot speak. We can confess with our songs and our music what is difficult to articulate with our words, our songs, our music represent our deepest desires and our truest feelings and our most staunch beliefs and core convictions. It is so hard to articulate to someone you love what they mean to you. But we can play a song. <laughs> That's why there's so many love songs in every age and generation, and they'll never go out of style. We sing what we cannot speak. Our songs give us a voice when our voice can't find the right words to say. Our songs give meaning to those moments that are beyond meaning. It's why music is so important at big times of our lives. It's why we have to sing all of the Christmas carols during Advent. It's why music is important at moments like funerals. Because when we hear Vince Gill sing, go rest high on that mountain, or Josh Groban sing, you raise me up to more than I can be. Even though they're not explicitly Christian, they convey our faith in the resurrection, our trust in the God who can raise, and our love for the one who's being raised. Or when we stand on the shore of a sea and watch the colorful sunset, stretch out from the right to the left as far as the eye can see, or when we stand far away from the city and see the starry, starry nights, or when maybe you and your combine are riding on an open field in central Illinois and a storm brews up and it's scary, but it's good and powerful, or when in our private moments we look in the mirror, really honestly admit and accept that we're broken and we're not as good as we want to believe we are, but that God loves us anyway. You know what you say in moments like that? Nothing. Because the words will never be there. But the song will be. That's why we sing our Savior God to thee, how great thou art. We sing, we sing not because you like every song. <laughs> we sing not because every song is well sung or well played. We sing not because every song is a moment of transcendence. But we sing because every song might be. So, How great thou art. Number 33 in your hymnal. Number two in your hearts. Let's stand. And it doesn't matter if you're on key or off key. Just sing. Let's stand and sing.